Lord. Yes, amen. Well, we want to welcome you this afternoon. I'm so used to saying morning, but it's this afternoon already. Last week, we shared a story on the life of Cain and Abel. And we talked about the contrasts between them. I want to continue on that theme, if you will. And my text is found in Naaman. About Naaman, it's found in 2 Kings chapter 5, please. 2 Kings chapter 5. And we'll begin at verse number 1. We'll be looking at the contrast between Naaman and Gehazi. And we're going to glean spiritual truths from their lives. 2 Kings chapter 5, please. We'll begin at verse number 1. Now Naaman was the captain of the host of the king of Syria. He was a great man with his master, honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. And he was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. Interesting. Verse 2. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel, a little maid. And she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, Would God my Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would be healed or recover from his leprosy. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand pieces of gold, and ten changes of remnant or clothing. We'll stop right there for now. Here we have a story of a great general named Naaman. And Naaman, the Bible says, was very well respected. He was a captain. He was a general of this great army of Syria. Syria dominated the world at this time. And everything was going well for this general. But the Bible tells us, however, he had leprosy. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen leprosy. It is a, a tragic, a horrific disease. It eats the exterior part of your body. It's like a skin or a flesh-eating disease. And this man was a great general, but he had this problem that plagued him. I've entitled this message, When God Says Seven, Six is Not Enough. When God says seven, six is not enough. And so what do I mean by this title? Well, we're going to find out in a few moments. We talked about contrast last week. We want to continue. Cain and Abel. There's Jacob and Esau, King Saul and David, the rich man and Lazarus. God uses contrast to teach spiritual principles that we can glean from his word. And as we begin this morning, I want you to notice Naaman started as a Gentile, a non-believer. He didn't believe in God. He believed in other gods, but didn't have a relationship with the true and living God. There's a lot of people who believe in many gods, but they don't have fulfillment in their lives. He was a leper. Not only was he a pagan believer in other gods, but he was a Gentile who was leprous. He had a disease. He was a Gentile who had a disease. The contrast, we have Gehazi that we're going to find out about in a few moments. Started off as a servant of the Lord. Gehazi was Elisha's servant, working in the ministry, if you will. A believer. But he ends up having leprosy. Isn't that amazing? And so we're going to see this story of contrast and how we can learn some principles of truth this morning. And I want you to notice verse 1 that Naaman is a captain. He's respected by his people. He's respected and honored by those that work with him. Even his peers admired him. But verse 1 tells us, watch this now, that the Lord had given deliverance. The Lord. Now, you might say, wait a minute. He's, he's supposed to be a non-believer. Yeah, he is. But we all need to understand that God still works through non-believers. 
you know, we get upset sometimes with the government and we say, well, pastor, how can this man be in office? How has this happened? How is this possible? He doesn't do this. He does this. You know, let me just tell you something, folks. It doesn't matter who's in office. God's in control. It doesn't matter who you voted for or didn't vote for. I know there might be some controversial issues here, but I'm telling you, it doesn't matter because God's in control. He gave this man victory over the enemies. He was a Gentile. And God called Cyrus, the Bible says Cyrus, Isaiah 45, who was a king of Persia, his servant. And the point of all this, that God is, is involved in the affairs of this world. Maybe you don't see it, maybe you don't understand it, but God's in control even with the wickedness that we see. Because the Bible says the king of the heart, his heart is in the hands of God. God's in the one who's leading, directing, and guiding. And you know what? We just need to trust the Lord despite who's, who's in office, who's not in office. Because if God gave victory, to a Syrian general he can give victory to you or any situation because God is the one who's sitting on the throne and we need to understand that so the Bible says that Naaman had victory he may have not realized it but it is God who gave him the victory now as I mentioned everything before that that although this man was great Although Naaman was a powerful man, it seems that all of his greatness shrivels up because of the last five words in verse number one. But he was a leper. Now, as I mentioned, I've seen leprosy before. I've been in India and I've traveled throughout the world and I've seen people who've been afflicted with this disease. It, it's a horrific disease. You are outcast you are most of the time you live in a colony away from the public it eats away the exterior part of your body your nose your fingers it's anesthetizes your nerve endings and and you you are an outcast and you are basically ridiculed by society so not only does leprosy affect you physically but it affects you emotionally and spiritually but somehow this leper Naaman had favor somehow he was esteemed somehow God had given him favor let me tell you something you can have leprosy but still have the favor of God you can have a problem in your life but God can still make a way for you and God made a way for this man now he didn't understand it he wasn't even a believer as I said God is working in between the lines for his purposes to be established and so what we see here now is a general who's esteemed by, by his, his people. God has given him favor. But for the rest of his life, he's on a relentless pursuit to be healed. Obviously, he wanted to be healed. Nobody who has leprosy wants to continue to be a leper. And so he had all these great things. You can have riches and power. But if you've got a, a, a disease that's, that's, that's causing you pain and you'll do whatever you can to be cured of that disease. You'll do whatever you can to be healed of whatever ails you. Cancer, leukemia, heart condition, whatever it is, this man had leprosy and it bothered him even though God had given him favor. And suddenly something happens to Naaman. Aren't you glad that you can just be walking in every day in the course of your life and all of a sudden something happens that changes your life? A phone call, a letter, somebody speaking with you. The Bible says that this little girl, there's a maidservant, uh, verse number two, we discover verse number three, go here, here, out of a land of Israel, a little maid, a little maid who waited, a little girl who waited, she was a servant of Naaman's wife. This little girl, verse number three, she was a believer. And she told Naaman's wife, you know what, uh, Mrs. Naaman? You know, I know Naaman's a great general, and I know he's got leprosy, but you know, there's a prophet in the land of Israel. His name is Elisha. If you can tell your husband to go visit to him, visit him, I know that God's going to heal him. Here's this little insignificant servant. Aren't you glad that God looks at what we think is insignificant and turns it into something significant? There's no such thing as insignificance when it comes to God. We're all called to be servants. And this little insignificant servant becomes the greatest voice for Naaman, and he didn't know it. 
I'll tell you, God can use anybody. You don't know who God's going to use. You can be walking down the street and you can bump into somebody and God has an angel there ready to give you a word. And you don't even know it's an angel. The Bible says in Hebrews 13 that sometimes we have entertained angels unaware. God just sends people your way. This was suddenly, just suddenly, uh, Naaman hears about this prophet. You don't know from one day to the next what can happen in your life. The God of the suddenlies can just come on the scene and bring something, show you something. So this girl speaks to Naaman's wife and tells him, there's this prophet in the land. Go and see him. I know that he can do something. He's starving for a cure, remember. And maybe his eyes are now opened up and he's all excited. And Naaman is thinking... That just somehow, God, if God's going to do this, I got I to gotta bring something with me. Notice the next verse, what happens here. Look what happens. The king of Syria said, go, and I will send a letter. And look what he does. He brings silver. He brings gold. He brings changes of clothes. Naaman is saying, you know, I'm going to go, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to this prophet, and I'm going to give him some money. I'm going to, you know, try to give him something to, you know, Maybe I can buy my healing or maybe I can earn my healing or maybe I'm so used to getting things in my life and buying things. Maybe, maybe I can do the same thing with this healing. So he brings all kinds of money with him. He brings extra set of clothing. He wants to maybe entice the prophet. He wants to maybe, you know, give him something in exchange that's what he's done all his life. He's got ahead. Everything he's done, he's had to buy it. He's got to work for it. And he probably thinks that maybe I've got to do that when it comes to my healing. That's how he thinks naturally. I'm going to buy it. I'm going to do this. I'm going to earn it. But friends, you can't buy your salvation. You can't earn your salvation. There's nothing you can pay the Lord that can cause a healing to take place. It's not about what you give to God physically. You can give whatever you can. It doesn't mean, it's not what you give. It's, it's, you can't come to God. You can't, you can't manipulate God. You, you can't come and twist God's arm by, by the amount you have in your wallet. That's not how we earn anything. We come to God through faith and faith alone. Maybe I can buy my healing. So he brings all kinds of money. Brings clothing. What he's trying to do is trying to do God's will, man's way. How many people are trying to do the will of God, man's way? You know what God's will is, but you see, you, you don't want to trust him. You don't want to completely believe that. You find it strange. You find it difficult. So maybe I can do God's will man's way. Do you remember Abraham? Didn't God tell Abraham, you're going to be a father of many nations? Remember that? And he says, uh, you're going to be a father of many nations. And, and by the way, it's going to be with your wife, Sarah. But, uh, but Lord, Sarah is barren. She can't have babies. Uh, you sure, Sarah, she, how can I be, my, Sarah can't give birth, Lord. And so Abraham was grappling with this problem. God told him exactly what's going to happen. This is the will of the Lord. So what does Abraham do? He didn't accept that, couldn't accept it. So he goes south and he meets a woman by the name of Hagar. And he's saying, Lord, maybe I can help you out a little bit. Me, me, I, mean, I, I believe you, Lord, but you know, maybe you need some help. Maybe I need to have a relation with another woman because my wife is barren. Trying to do God's will man's way. God is saying, no, no, Abraham, I didn't want you to have any relations with Hagar, but you did it anyway. You see, when things don't make sense to us, we try to do things man way. When things don't make sense to us, we'll try to figure out a natural way of doing things. I'm going to buy my healing. I don't know this God. I don't really know how this operates. But I'm going to try to entice because I got the power to do so. So he brings all this money. Notice verse 9. I'm going to be sharing more like a narrative sermon this morning. Notice verse 9. He's all excited. He ends up at Elisha's house. So Naaman came with his horses, all this great 
chariots and he stood by this door and the contrast continues. This small little hut. When you talk about the house of Elisha, really the translation of house is he lived in a kind of like a, like a shack. It wasn't even a house. Here's Naaman in his greatness. Here's Elisha in his modesty. And he's got all this money and clothing. And Elisha knows that he's coming. And Elisha in verse 9 says to his servant, I want you to go to, uh, to this man and tell him to go dip yourself in the Jordan River for just seven times. And Elisha sent a messenger saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your body, your flesh will come alive again. Be clean. It will be cleansed. It will be cleansed. Verse 11. But Naaman was upset. He didn't like that. Naaman gets upset. Well, wait a minute. Don't you know who I am? I'm a general. I'm the general of the greatest armies of the land. I was told to come here, Mr. Elisha prophet, and you send me your servant? Do you not know? What God, God's dealing with is pride. See? You know, when God wants to do something in your life, you know what he goes for first? Your pride. My pride. Are you going to trust him? Are you going to put aside all this, this, this self-containment, self-righteousness? He deals with his pride. Do you have to always be right? Is it always about you? God deals with your pride. He sends a servant. He gets upset for two reasons. Why didn't you come yourself, Elisha? And number two, you tell me to go dip myself in the water, Jordan, the river Jordan, seven times. What kind of prescription for healing is that? And he gets angry and he's about to leave. How many times do you get angry and you're about to leave because your pride doesn't like what you hear? Does he not know who I am? And what kind of... What, are you kidding me? I thought. Did you notice? I thought. See? We think we... Always what we think... I've, we seem to figure out how God operates all the time. We got it all figured out. This is how God works. I thought, I thought he will surely come. I thought this is what needs to happen. I thought, and now he comes. He doesn't pray for me. He doesn't, he doesn't wave some kind of magic wand or, or some kind of healing ointment. He just tells me to go dip myself in the water. I, that doesn't make sense. And, and he, said, he, said, he said here, and call on the name of his Lord, his God, not my God, his God, and strike his hand over the place and that I would recover of leprosy. Naaman is saying, I thought he would come to me and not only that I thought he would come and pray or do something but nothing's happening here and so what does he do he gets mad but Naaman was upset wroth he's angry and he went away and he said behold I thought there's a thought again and then he says hey hold on a second are not the Abana and the Far apart rivers of Damascus better than the Jordan? This natural thinking. He's thinking, wait a minute. I'm not going to go dip myself in this measly river, the Jordan. By the way, has anybody ever been to the Jordan? Well, some of you coming to Israel, you know, it's not this illustrious, great, majestic river. It's, it's, it's not much at all to look at, I'll be honest with you. A stream of water in some respects. Not very deep. So I understand when Naaman said, what's this? Naaman is thinking naturally. Huh, this, this is not a river. I'll show you a river. Come to, come to Syria. Come to Damascus. I'll show you what river. Naaman is thinking in the natural realm. He's thinking somehow if I dip myself in a beautiful river, nice flowing river, something in the water might heal me. But that's not what God is saying at all. It's not about the depth of the water. The beauty of the lake. It's like some of us with the Bible. Some of us think that there's some mystical, magical power about the Bible. The leather, the pages. Let me tell you something. There's nothing spiritual or magical about this Bible. Now, hold on before you say heresy. I'm not talking about what's written in the Bible. Everything that's written in the Bible is 
powerful. It's the word of God. But some of us look at the Bible like some good luck charm. Let me see if I can carry it in my body here. I got it in my coat. I'm going to work. I have it in my, I'm going to put New Testament and I'm putting it in my pocket. And when I go to bed at night, I'm going to make sure I put it right beside my night table, you know, because there's, there's power in the Bible. Let me tell you something. There's no power in the Bible. It's, it's, it's they're just pages and leather bound. What has power is what's written in the Bible. That's what has power. It's not about knowing the letter of the law. Do you know the author of the Bible? That's what, it's not about knowing this. It's what, do you know the author of the Bible? You might be able to quote the Bible, but do you know the author of the Bible? That's what has power. I've been to some homes, believe me, over the years, not this church necessarily, but I've been. Oh man, I go have a cup of I see a big fat Bible on their coffee table. It's been on book of Isaiah 53 for the last 20 years. You know. <laughs> when I talk to that person, hey, can we just have a Bible? Yes, yeah, can you turn to the book of Obadiah, please? He goes, Oba who? <laughs> Oba what? Listen. If you don't read this and study this, it's just a book. Naaman is saying, I'm not going to dip myself in it. It's just water. This is nothing. I'm going to show you water. He's thinking naturally. We think naturally. Maybe it's the different location maybe it's a different if I just get a bit this and maybe if my if we can just sing one more hymn if we can just get a bigger this if we can just get a larger if we can just fix this we think somehow we'll get the blessing of God if we just change the, something in the natural realm I don't want to go to Jordan let me go to Abana let me thinking somehow that naturally that's how the presence of God it's got nothing to do with that he wants to make a point the point of obedience. If God said Jordan, and he's telling you seven times, six is not good enough. And if he's telling you Jordan, then Abana and Fephar rivers mean nothing. I don't care how beautiful they are. We think that God is in it if it's beautiful and gorgeous. So we paint Jesus as a beautiful, blonde, gorgeous, blue-eyed uh, he-man. And Jesus didn't have blonde hair. I can guarantee you that. And he didn't have white, white skin. I can guarantee you twice that. Because he was a Hebrew. He probably had jet black hair and possibly an olive complexion. So let's stop thinking that God has to look like some, some, some beautiful fashion model. or What? We think somehow that if we can just make, you know, I've been to Israel and, and they, 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 they believe there's two schools of thought of where Jesus uh, had his tomb. And one place, they have this tomb and... And they have made it so beautiful. Everything scenic, like the, you know, and, 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 and I, there's another place where it doesn't look that sophisticated, kind of ordinary, and, you know, it doesn't look very nice, and we kind of think that God is always in the most beautiful and the most decorative. And let me remind you, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, not Athens or Rome. Bethlehem. No man's land at the day. wasn't born any kind of pomp or sophistication. There were no trumpets, no red carpets. I'm not going to dip myself seven times in this Jordan River. This is not a river. I'm going to where there's a real river. And so he's angry. And many times we do the same thing, putting God in a box. We don't see the larger picture. Not only did Naaman say he's going to pray, he says he's going to pray to his God, not my God. Naaman didn't even know who the God of Elijah is. Can you imagine that? 
Now, this is really powerful because we kind of figure, well, doesn't God usually heal those that, you know, I mean, he wasn't even his, he didn't even know him. I've heard people tell me, you know, when you get prayed for, you make sure that you fasted 20 days and make sure that you are, you know, everything's got to follow this particular pattern, otherwise God won't hear you. Let me tell you something. A lot of times God will heal you and you don't even know who he is. There's no prescription. Now I know we need faith as believers, but I'll tell you something. Some people who get touched by God don't even know who God. I prayed for a woman who didn't even believe, laughed at me when I prayed for her, was making fun of me when I prayed for her. Two weeks later, she comes running into the store. I was working with my mother years ago. Comes running into the store, tears streaming down her face. She dropped a three to 400 pound stereo system on her toe. It destroyed the nail, completely turned it black, and it was so damaged, almost severed it. There were no nerves left in her, in her toe. And I prayed for God to heal her. She laughed at me. I was trying to witness to her. She mocked me, mocked me. Two weeks later, she comes running with tears streaming down her face. Dino, Dino, I can't believe it. What's the matter with you? I can't believe it. My toe, my nail it grew back. It, my, there's no blackness. It, everything got, she couldn't believe it. I see a very similar scenario here. We think we have to be in church at a certain place. We forgot to... To heal people. We, we think we've got to have everything in a certain way for God to move. That's not how God operates. Some of the greatest work that God has done is outside of the church. But Naaman was upset. That's what usually happens with pride. When God tells you to do something and you don't like it, usually you end up getting very upset. But you see, God was trying to do something in the life of Naaman. As he tries to do in your life and in my life, he tries to break us. But he doesn't break us to break. He breaks us to bless us. He wants to strip Naaman of his pride. And that's why he told Naaman to do the things that he did. Will you obey what I'm telling you? Sometimes God will say something for you to do that will not make sense. But he's doing it to humble you. He's doing it to speak to you. He's doing it to get your attention. Because, because you see, he wants to go deep in your life. And Naaman is a great general. And what God's doing, he's stripping Naaman of his pride. He's trying to strip Naaman from all that exterior pompousness, all that re religious pompous, this tradition. He wants to break it. He says, I, I can't have that. If you're going to come to me, that's got to be broken. Naaman had to be humbled and God is humbling this man and he's stripping him. And like I said this morning, sometimes God will strip you of your dignity so he can bring you into your destiny. He'll strip you of it. Your self-reliance and our pride and our self-containment. Remember, Naaman is used to being in control. And now he's not in control. And it bothers him. And God will strip you of trying to be in control all the time. And there'll be pain. There'll be pain involved. You'll never learn a lesson without some kind of pain, by the way, folks. That's just the way it is. And so he turns and goes away. I'm not going to stand for this. I'm going to go to a better place. This is ridiculous. Sometimes God does not make sense to you. And you're upset. God tells you, I want you to go seven times. You said, that doesn't make sense to me. There's no way. I'm going back to what I know. We always seem to go back to what we know. To what we're comfortable. You see, God wants to make you uncomfortable. Oh, that's another sermon. See, God, listen, he's not concerned about your comfort. I'm telling you now. He wants you to be comfortable in certain ways. I understand that. But God is, listen, he's more concerned about your holiness than your comfort, okay? He's more concerned about walking right with him than being comfortable. And you see, Naaman didn't like this. He wanted to go back to what he's used to, to what he's comfortable in. And that's what we do. When God does something or you're going through a hard time, we go back to what is comforting for us. For some of us, it's food. For some of us, it's drugs. For some of us, it's... Some illicit relationship. 
We don't like what's going on and so we go back to what we are comfortable in doing. I'm going back. I don't need this. I don't like these waters here. But God wants to speak to him. He wants to touch him. He wants to, to break him. He wants to mold him. He's the, he's the potter. You and I are the clay. And when God is refining us, it isn't always fun in games. Uh, you remember, we get into the furnace, uh, but God is the God of the furnace. And, and if he has you in the furnace, stay put. God wants to melt away some of those alloys of pride and self-dependency, self but they only can melt away in the furnace. And so Naaman gets angry. Isn't it amazing that this great king was told to go see Elisha by a little insignificant servant? Do you know that all the great people in Naaman's life were very small, insignificant servants? They weren't the generals, the presidents. God used the servants. He told Naaman, through this little girl to go see Elisha. Now watch this. God uses another servant to stop this man. All of a sudden, we see the next verse. His servants came near and spoke to him. He said, look, my father is showing reverence. He's not his father. He's just, it's just a, a, a word of endearment. It's a, it's a term they use of respect. My father, if the prophet told you to do something great, wouldn't you have done it? Wouldn't you have done it? He's asking you to do something so small. Why, why are you struggling with that? And what about you and me? If God tells you to do something, you, you, it seems too strange. Didn't seem to make sense to you. Go and dip yourself seven. I've never heard of these things, Lord. Doesn't make sense. Too easy. Somehow we think it's got to be so hard, so complicated. Serving is saying, if, God, if the prophet told you to do something really hard, you'd probably do it, wouldn't you? So why are you, if he, well, he's asking you to do this, why is this bothering you? Just go and dip yourself and, and, and you never know. Just obey what he's saying, Naaman. Stop trying to be in control all the time, Naaman. What about you and me? We always have to be in control? Does it always have to be your way? Finally, Naaman listens. Huh. It took a while, but isn't it amazing that Naaman seemed to listen to the servants? Interesting, isn't it? Oh, but this is for free, by the way. If you meet somebody that you think might not be so, listen, you never know. God might have a word for you. Huh? God might have something to say through that person that you might not think is so, but God can use anybody. You listen. You never know what the Lord has to say. And so here is Naaman. And by the way, friends, do never despise the day of small beginnings because we're all called to be servants, are we not? And so we see if the prophet told you, so he listens and he ends up going. And there he is. There he is. He's about to do something he never thought he would ever do. Can you look at verse 14, George? Now watch this, verse 14. Then he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan according... Now here's the key, because this is the crux of the matter. According to the saying of the man of God. According to the word of the Lord. When God says seven, six isn't good enough. What did he tell him? I want you to dip yourself seven times. So he's off. And he did exactly that. And when he came up, his flesh was like a little baby. He was completely cleansed, completely washed, completely healed. Can you imagine that? Completely, completely. That's amazing. Now, now you probably might think that Naaman was a little self-conscious. Maybe you'd be. Can you imagine this great general? Remember, he's full of pride. God wants to break his pride. God wants to make, because he won't listen to you if you've got a contrite, if you're not contrite in spirit. Remember what it says in Isaiah 66 2, I will look upon him. I will look upon him. I will look upon him. What? What's the criteria? Who has a broken and contrite spirit. That's it. 
Not because you're a general. Not because you're some pompous. It doesn't matter who you are. If your heart isn't contrite, if your heart isn't broken, he's not looking at you. He's not listening at you. I don't care how many times you quote the scriptures. I don't mean how many times you come to church. If your heart isn't right before God, he's not listening. I say, Pastor Dino, come on. I'm just listening to the word. What does the word say? For all those things hath my hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord, but to this man, here's the man right here, not over there, right here. Who is it? Even to him who is poor and of a contrite spirit. And here's a, here's a, here's a biggie, here's a biggie, here's a biggie. Here, here it is, here it is, here it is, here it is. Who trembles at my word? Ah. I'm not saying someone who puts the, the Bible beside his night table and he goes to bed, there's the word. No, 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 no. I'm but has the word in his heart. And, 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 and you have reverence, you're trembling. You have, rever you have holy awe before the Lord. Awe, reverence, holy fear. Oh, we don't like those words today. But that's what God has called us to have reverence. Reverence, who trembles at my word. And so, God is going to do something powerful. In verse 14, George, we're going to read it again before we move on. Watch this now, watch this. Verse 14. And so he dips himself seven times. Now you can probably see his soldiers are around him, his group, his army. And maybe you can see if you have any kind of imagination. Some of them might be snickering at Naaman. He's actually doing this? Is he kidding? Is he, has he lost his mind? How many times will people ridicule you and mock you because you want to obey the voice of the Lord? Huh? It won't make sense to them. And he's going down once, and they're mocking, and maybe Naaman is thinking, am I doing the right thing? I don't know. So many times we believe in God for something, and we don't really see it right away. We get nervous. He goes down once, nothing's happening. Goes down twice, nothing's happening. All he's hearing is, the, is, the, is the, the, maybe the bit of the mockery and maybe some of the laughings behind the scenes going on. Maybe his soldiers are taunting in some way. Is this man serious? Is this the one who's our general? He's going down once, he's going down twice, he's not healed. He's going down three times, he's not healed. He's going down four times, he's not healed. Now they're really mocking him. Naaman is starting to question certain things. He goes down five times. He's still not healed. He goes down six times. He's still not healed. Uh, but in his mind, he says, ah, let me go all the way. I go down seven times. And as he rises the seventh time, completely healed. When God says seven, six is not good enough. Oh, 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 it's good enough for the world. But pastor, you know, I really tried. I did it six times, you know. Oh, you know, I, 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 I used to come to church. And I, I've, I've, been, I've been to the prayer meetings. I, I went a few times. We think somehow if we have gone a certain amount. But you see, folks, it's not about that, is it? Because when God says, I want this from your life, whether it's seven times or 107 times, if we don't get there, it's either God's way or man's way. You see, the number six is man's way. He rises and he's completely healed. Can you imagine? Completely healed. And what does Naaman do? He does what comes natural to any one of us, perhaps. He wants to go back. Now, watch this. This is very important. Don't, I don't want to lose you. Listen to this. He goes back to Elisha, the prophet. And the Bible says he wants to give him something. To say thank you. Now that, 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 that's okay. 
<laughs> you want to say thank you for someone, you know. And he returned to the man of God and all his company. And he came and he stood before him and he said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. And that's all that needed to know. And that's my prayer. That when we come to this church in this city, that people who come, who know, they will sense that there is a God in this place, that there's a God in this city, and that's why we pray the way we do. We want God to be glorified. We will know that there's a God in this place. Now, therefore, he says, I just take this. I want to say thank you. That's okay. I got healed. Thank you, Mr. Elijah, the prophet. I, I'm so great. But isn't that how we should respond as believers? If God has touched your heart, there should be gratitude. And you're going to want to give too. I'm not only talking monetarily. I'm not only talking about money. I'm talking about your life, your service. And that's why when I talk about the tithing, I don't talk about the tithing. Some of you come up to me. Pastor, why don't you say something? I won't. And I'll tell you why. When you take the offering, I might say thank you for your love and your support, period. But I'm not talking about because I honestly believe if God has touched your heart, I don't need to say one word. You're going to want to give. And if you don't believe me, just come to a couple of services and you'll see. Because I believe that when God touches the hearts of people, there's a willingness to give of yourself, whether it's monetary, whether it's whatever it is. There's a willingness to give. And so now Elisha wants to give. He's been moved. He's been touched. And, and also with our worship. When God, you want to worship him, the same thing. Giving is a part of worship. And that's what happens. When God touches you, you want to worship him. You want to express some kind of gratitude. I don't understand how people can come to church and not worship God. Stay home. Sorry, stay home. If you can't worship it, stay home. What? Because what, when you're, what are you coming here for? You're coming to give yourself to the, you're coming to express thanks. You're coming to express something to the Lord. You're not only coming to receive, you're also coming to give. You want to say, thank you, Lord. I want to praise you. I want to worship you. I want to give you praise. <laughs> now, Pastor Dino, why are you saying this? Are you going to scare people away again? Listen, I love you and I'm glad you're here. And if you don't like what I said, I love you still. But I'm only telling you the truth. Amen. I'm not here to build a church. I'm here to tell you about Jesus and to tell you what the word says. And if you love God, you're going to want to give something back. Something's going to come. Something's going to be expressed. I don't understand. There's no secret agents with God. If you're a secret agent, you're not with God. You might be with 007, but you're not with God. Oh, my God. Behold, now I know, verse 15, that there's a God. <laughs> and so he goes to give something to Elisha, and Elisha says, no, thank you, verse 15. But he said, as the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive nothing. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. Like I said this morning, I went to their beautiful sister, uh, Katrina and Giuseppe, they invited us, my family, my wife and I, for dinner two weeks ago. She made a beautiful, beautiful, wonderful meal. Now, Katrina, after I had supper, my wife and I at your house, how would you feel if I, at the end, went up to you and said, uh, oh, Katrina, you know, could you, here, t thank you, here's $100. What, 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 what do you think? You're gonna, gonna smack me, okay. <laughs> going to smack me. That's a good one. I haven't been, uh, that's a, don't ever smack me. Okay. <laughs> so, so, uh, it's an insult. Isn't it an insult, Katina? It's an insult. Yeah. You can't get more insulting than going to a friend's house and they want to pay for the, what? Can you imagine? That's how it was to Elisha. You see, it wasn't Elisha who healed him. God healed them. Ah, but the contrast must start somewhere. And I'm going to close with this point. Watch now what happens with Gehazi. Verse 17, George, I want you to see. 
And Naaman said, Shall there not then, I pray thee, be given to thy servant two mules? Verse 18, watch this now. And in this thing the Lord pardon thy servant when the master goeth. Verse 19, now watch this. And so he said unto him, Go in peace. So he departed from him a little way. But here it is, verse 20. Now watch this. I fast forward to this verse. So Gehazi, who's in the church, who's Elisha's servant, he's, he's noticing what's going on. He notices Naaman, the general, got healed. He's giving money. He wants to bless Elisha. And, and Elisha says, no, you know, it's all right. God bless you. God healed you. And this was bothering Gehazi. Gehazi, the servant. And I, he, and he, what? He said, behold. And so, and so Gehazi runs after Naaman. My master, he says, he comes up to Naaman. He's following, he, you know, Gehazi followed after Naaman. He's actually ran. He's running, man. The Bible's, he's running away. Don't, don't, I got to talk to you. He's, boy, there's something stirred up within him. He can't have this. He can't, he's running after Naaman. He says, Naaman, excuse me. Uh, line number one, contract. Uh, my master sent me. Uh, your master did not send you. You sent yourself because you are full of greed. You're a liar. My master sent me, uh, can you please, uh, oh, by the way, by the way, we have these two prophets from Ephraim. Oh, really? And, uh, you know, we're going to have to provide for them. We need some money. So can you also help us with that? And he said, all is well. My master has sent me. Behold, even now there be come to me in the Mount Ephraim two young men, the sons of the prophets. Give them, I pray thee, a talent of silver and two changes of ground. What? Deception. Why do you think we preach so strongly on guarding your heart? You know, your heart can be very deceptive and very deceiving if you don't watch it. Remember, Gehazi's in the church. Gehazi is in the church. Gehazi is an assistant with Elisha. He saw miracles in the power of God. Huh? This wasn't a man who saw and experienced what God did. He's running after him. Verse 23, George. And Naaman said, be content, take the two talents, etc., etc., and go. And he laid before one of the two servants, and he bare them to go before him. Verse 24, and now watch this. And when it came to the tower, he took them from their land and bestowed them in the house. So now he's hiding these other servants. Elisha is going back. And watch this now. And he departed, but he went in, he stood before his master. So he's coming home after this, this, this ex experience with, with Naaman and all this money. He, and he, he threw away, he got the other servants away so he wouldn't see them and he's going in secretly at night notice the word secretly doesn't want anybody to see him doesn't want anybody to know so he got rid of all the people that were around him and he's going secretly he figures nobody's around everybody's sleeping ah but there's Elisha waiting for him <laughs> be sure your sin will find you out numbers 23 we think somehow we can fool God we think somehow we can just run away and escape and, you know, just get into a, if I, you know, do something in secret, I, I'll protect myself, I'll get rid of the other servants, uh, Naaman's not here to tell Elisha what's going on, I'm going to get away with, you can't get away with these things. God will not be mocked. Oh, hi, Gehazi. How you doing, my servant, my, my assistant pastor, how you doing? My fellow minister of the gospel, how you doing? Was church good today? Did you have a good worship service? Did you praise the Lord today? How was the offering? Did you give? To Wonderful. God bless you. How you doing, Gehazi? And he said unto him, Oh, I went not my heart with thee. When man turned again from his chariot to meet thee. How, how did it go with Naaman, by the way, uh, you thought I didn't know about that, eh? Uh, you see, God reveals things, you know. God speaks to people, you know. God can show you something about a situation. See, Gehazi was a servant of God. Everybody thought that, but Elisha saw beyond the exterior. 
God can unzip the natural realm into the spiritual realm and he can show you things that nobody else can see because God is the one who reveals these things. And so Gehazi thinks he's got away with it. Oh, he's praising God. He's shouting. And... Didn't Jesus do that in the book of Revelation? I know thy works. Revelation 3, 1, that you have an appearance of being godly, but appearance of being alive, but you're dead. What? You have an appearance. Appearance. What's on the outside? But I see what's on the inside. Jesus has this vision that is beyond the natural realm. You can see into the hearts of men. And Gehazi is caught red-handed trying to cover up his sin, lie and deceive. Have you ever been caught in a situation like that? Have you ever been caught red-handed in some kind of deception or some kind of lie? It's a, that's a tough place to be in. But despite how tough it is, Gehazi had a choice to make it right, and he didn't. Because God is merciful. He could have repented. He could have said, I'm so sorry, Elisha. I, I'm lying to you. I, I have this problem with greed. I love things and money. and I'm sorry, I did the wrong thing. I lied. He could have done it, but he didn't do it. God will always give you an opportunity to make it right. And the Bible tells us that the leprosy of Naaman that was healed came upon him. Whoa! Imagine that! You can't fool God. You can't, you can't mock God. Because that's what he did. And so what's the lesson? What's the application? What do we learn? Remember, there's a contrast, Gehazi and Naaman. What do we learn from this story? What, kind of, what, 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 what do we learn from this? What do we learn? Give you some principles as we close in the, in, the, in the application. Watch this now. Number one. Number one. It's not what's on the outside that matters, but what's on the inside. What is seen on the outside could be totally different what's on the inside. It's what's done in secret. The secret of being a saint is being a saint in secret. I was preaching in Pakistan. In, when was it, Nadia? In 2001? I think so. I remember I was in Brantford at the time. But Fred Malik brought me there. And I was in this hotel, and they told me, watch, don't drink the water. I said, no problem, I won't touch the water. So I'm in the hotel, and I see this beautiful, I mean, this silver, gorgeous. It was big, like a, a silver kind of, I don't even know what it was. You know, but it, it, obviously it had water. It had water. I could see the water, and it had glass in the bottom, and you can see the silver, beautiful decoration, and there was glasses, silver, beautiful, right beside it. It was like a, a set. I said, this is wonderful, and there was water there, and I was thirsty. It was like 40 degrees Celsius, you know, and I went, I said, well, this water must be, must be good. It's in the hotel room. It's in a beautiful silver tray and glasses to match. <laughs> no problem. It looks great. Took the water, the pair, put it in the glass, and I drank a whole glass of water. And, you know, the water didn't taste that good, but I was so thirsty, it didn't matter. Well, that was about two hours before I was ready to preach. About 20 minutes after that so-called, uh, you know, Water, my stomach. I, if you can hear my stomach to Afghanistan and Pakistan, you can hear it. My stomach started turning, noises. I didn't know how to end my stomach. No, noises I never thought I could come out of my stomach. I, I felt sick, I was throwing up. I, I, I couldn't move, I, was, I felt weak. I, I, I collapsed on the bed. I threw up so much. I said, What is I, and then the pastor called me because I was ready to preach. This is in a big campaign. There were like six, 7,000 people at this, at this place. And I'm 
dying. Literally, I felt, honestly, I, I was literally, I felt I was dying. And of course, it was the, the, the water. I had like the worst case of food poisoning, water poisoning you can possibly imagine. And I said, Pastor, I, I can't, I can't. And so, but God's grace, I couldn't move. Began to pray. And God supernaturally raised me out of that bed and I preached that day, supernaturally. But my point is this, not that I got healed. I thought the water was great because of how it looked. Would you not want to drink from something that looks like it's from, from the king's palace? I never thought this water wasn't drinkable. Don't ever judge by what you see on the outside. Number two. Remember, Gehazi's in the church. Number two, number two, number two, number two. Leprosy came back off of Naaman onto Gehazi. Why? Because whatever you sow, you will reap. Number three, number three. What do we learn? You can't do God's will, man's way. When God says seven, six won't do. Naaman got healed because he obeyed the voice of the Lord. Half? No. All the way. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust. Do you think Naaman would have been healed if he went down five or six times? Some of us would say, well, pastor, five, six, that isn't bad, is it? But when God says seven, six, let's all stand together. I want every head bowed just for a moment. I know some people have to leave. And if you must leave, God bless you. We love you. We're so grateful that you're with us today. But, but, but if you can just stay a little longer. I know our time is run. I want every head bowed just for a moment, please. And I want you to listen very carefully to me because I know some of you are grappling with some things and I just sense it in my own heart and I want to release this. Now, I don't know who I'm speaking to, but I know there's people here that are struggling with with doing what God has called you to do or asked you to do. I repeat, you know that God has asked you to do something because you've been praying about it and you some of you have had that revelation, but you're struggling because it doesn't really make sense to you. Or maybe it just seems that it's not possible and it's confusing you. And it's causing you to be apprehensive. I'm going to ask you to dip yourself seven times. I'm going to ask you this morning, this afternoon, stop wavering at dip number four or dip number five. I, I want you to go all the way because when God says seven, six is not enough. Because I have decided to follow Jesus. I can't turn back now. See, I can't. I can't do it. Some of you, not many, but some of you, have allowed some of the things of your past to creep up. And like Naaman, you're going back to the river of Abana. And God says, no, no, no I want you to go to Jordan. It's, it's not back there. Why? Because I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. And some of you, now watch this now, some of you are reaping something that you've done that you need to get rid of because it's not very tasteful. It's time to say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Lord, I need to repent from that. Now, this is the toughest one for some of you. But I know for some of you, you need to repent. Now, I don't know who I'm speaking to, and I know my time is gone because it's always gone. And that's no news here. But I'll tell you something. I'm not letting you go today. Because today, I'm asking you to go further. I'm asking you to go seven times. Enough now. You got to go all the way. And if there's something you need to deal with, you got to deal with it now. 
Don't put it off anymore. Don't put it off. And you know, if the Lord is speaking to you and you know the difference, don't go back to Abana. It's time to come to the Jordan. Come to the Jordan. And say, Lord, not my will be done, but yours. We bow our hearts. We bend our knees. Remember, it's humility he's looking for. Oh, Spirit, come make. Let me. Uh, who is the Lord speaking to? Not me. Not this story. Who is the Lord speaking to right now? The, you, there's three things I've shared with you. you it, it could be any one of those three, but I know the Lord is speaking. I'm going to ask you to get out of your pew because we're going to pray today. We're going to pray. We're going to spend some time in prayer. I know my time is gone, but I'd rather, I'd rather pray with you and seek the Lord together and, and make it right. Then I can go home and have a good lunch, if you know what I mean. But, but we need to do that first. I'm going to say, Pastor, the Lord is speaking to me. I don't know what about, but the Lord is speaking. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand. Nobody looking, please. Thank you. Quite a few hands. Now, I'm going to ask you to go further. I'm going to ask you to dip yourself seven times. Seven times. Seven times. What I mean by that is, I want you to come to the altar. I want you to come to the Jordan right now. I want you to get out of your pews. Stop floundering. Just get out of your pews. And I want you to come right up here. And we're going to pray together. I don't care if people know you or don't know you. I don't care what you might think or what they're going to think of me. Remember, Naaman didn't care. And it's time for you and I to do the same thing. It doesn't matter who's here or who's not here. What matters is i got to obey what God is saying. That's what matters. It doesn't matter what river it is. What matters is what God is saying. bow our hearts we bend our knees oh spirit come make us humble my god we give you praise now we turn our eyes from evil things oh lord we cast down our idols clean hands. My God, hear us. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. invite my wife pastor melody i'm going to invite sister joyce i'm going to invite the praise team that were here to come and find somebody some board members to come and find somebody and put your hand on their shoulder got a couple of youth over here i want you to find somebody and i want you to put your hand on their shoulder we're going to pray together we're going to believe god together Let me just say one more thing. Don't ever think coming to the altar is a waste of time. That's what the devil wants you to think. That's a lie. This is a picture of the Jordan River, so to speak, in the spirit realm. And it's not about the physicality. It's about the obedience. Now, what I want to ask those that have your hand I want you to start praying I don't have to always pray by the way folks in case you didn't know that it's not about the pastor it's about God and what he can do through you through his people so I'm going to ask the people to start praying I want you to start interceding now for the individuals that you're praying for start praying for them 
and we're going to continue to worship the Lord. I'm going to pray in a few moments, but I want those that are, and by the way, those that are praying for you, I acknowledge them. They are people of God. You have nothing to worry about it. Let them pray for you. Remember, it's not them, it's the Spirit of God.